Good evening, I'm Jim Lara in Washington. And I'm Robert McNeil in New York. After tonight's news summary, four Middle East experts analyzed the peace breakthrough between Israel and the PLO. Then a report from Geneva on the Bosnian peace talks, and from Belgrade, a look at the bite of economic sanctions on Serbia. We close with a report by Jeffrey Kay on farm workers after the death of their leader, Cesar Chavez. As Jeffrey Kay of public station KCET Los Angeles is the correspondent. Last April, 35,000 mourners came to Central California to pay tribute to the leader of the United Farm Workers Union, Cesar Chavez. For workers and celebrities gathered at his funeral, Chavez's struggle for the rights of farm workers placed him on a pedestal next to Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. When Cesar Chavez stood up for the rights of the poor, he did it in a way that demonstrated the essential honor and decency of the lowest income and voiceless of America. The movement Chavez helped create won farm workers the right to organize. They are now eligible for social security and workers' compensation. <laughs> Drinking water and bathrooms are now requirements in the fields of California. At unionized farms like Monterey Mushrooms near San Jose, Workers say they appreciate the benefits of a UFW labor contract. Well, the difference between people who don't have a union and we that have a union is that we do have medical insurance. We have better benefits. They can lay them off whenever they want. They can fire them whenever they want. And us is different. Here, workers average $7.75 an hour. But Monterey Mushrooms is the exception. Most farm workers have no union representation, no contracts, and earn lower wages with few benefits, if any. Despite the gains of the 70s and the achievements of Cesar Chavez, life for farm workers still often resembles the grapes of wrath. Many farm workers and their advocates say conditions today are as bad as they've ever been. In June, officials in Northern California found 600 migrant farm workers and their children working and living in a rain-soaked cherry orchard. Many hadn't been paid in days. They were waiting for the farm labor contractor who hired them to bring their paychecks. Their only sanitary facilities, a filthy toilet, and one hose to shower and drink with. Pues... We barely make enough to live on, this worker said. We sleep here in our camper with our two kids and our newborn baby. Some of the workers here earned as little as two fifty an hour. State Labor Inspector Charlie Atilano said he was horrified by what he saw. Some of the kids were working on the fields and uh, helping their parents to uh, pick. There was two-year-old children out there, uh, kids that were just uh, walking around in their bare feet. The conditions were deplorable at that, uh, at that site. State officials imposed fines for violations of housing, health, wage, and child labor laws. But investigators say conditions like these are all too common. They complain they lack the resources to adequately police the fields. <laughs> At a farm labor camp in Madera, California, workers are up before the sun. These men have no union representation and no benefits. They live six to a room. They are lucky they have a mattress, but some places they don't have any, any mattress. They stay in the floor. Farm labor advocate Luis Magana said the camp is owned by a labor contractor. Increasingly, farmers are using contractors to supply workers. The contractors often take the costs of housing, food, and transportation out of the employees' paychecks, incomes which frequently amount to less than the minimum wage. 19-year-old Philadelpho Vasquez, a garlic picker, has worked in the field since he was 16. Mm, Right now, it's not very good, said Vasquez. He makes two dollars for each basket he fills. On this day, he expected to make just over three dollars an hour. His story is a familiar one to Don Viarejo, a former UFW activist who now heads the California Institute for Rural Studies. Viarejo says the state's estimated 900,000 farm workers have less spending power today than they did 15 years ago. There's no question in my mind that conditions have gotten worse. Real wages have declined over the past 15 years, significantly declined, perhaps 15 to 18% decline in that period. 
Villarejo estimates that the average farm worker earns about $6,500 a year. He says one reason conditions have worsened is there's been a growing influx of migrant laborers. Increasing numbers of them are Indians fleeing poverty in Mexico and Central America. Today, the sheer numbers of people are being used to advantage by employers. If there's 100 people competing for every job, then clearly the employer can say, well, I'll pay less. And anybody who takes that will get the job. And somebody will be desperate enough to take it. So wages are being bid down. Working conditions are deteriorating as a result of this process. But what about the UFW? By many accounts, the union is no longer the aggressive labor organizer it once was. Critics say, in general, it is less active in the fields. In particular, according to Luis Magana, it's failed to address the plight of the new migrants the Indians from Latin America. They have to change. They have to prove that they are able to include in this new, new, new group. I don't know how they can do it, but they have to do it. Are they doing they, it? They are not doing it. Labor inspector Atilano, himself a former UFW organizer, agrees the union has greatly reduced its activism. There hasn't been anything going on in terms of organizing. Uh, when organizing was taking place, the minimum wage for farm workers was substantially higher. We haven't stopped organizing. We've never stopped organizing. Arturo Rodriguez is the new president of the UFW. Rodriguez, who is Cesar Chavez's son-in-law, says the union continues to organize aggressively and has not ignored the new migrants. He operates from the UFW's longtime headquarters in California's Tehachapi Mountains. The complex, called La Paz, which means peace, was once the site of a tuberculosis sanitarium. This is where Chavez worked and lived, and where he is now buried. Rodriguez says the UFW is carrying on in the tradition of Chavez, yet he admits the union's strength has declined. He says the UFW has difficulty obtaining contracts. See, the issue with farm workers is not organizing, not organizing for elections, but is getting contracts. And if you can't get a contract, then there's no sense in organizing for an election. Because all you've done to those workers, you've exposed them, you've identified for that grower who the leadership is at that particular ranch, and in most cases they're going to either be fired, and if once they're fired, they're blacklisted from the industry. Although UFW organizers are still active in the fields, they say they've been hampered by political changes. In the late 70s, during the UFW's heyday, its organizing was supported by helpful state regulators. But since 1980, a succession of Republican administrations cut back on labor law enforcement. At the same time, internal dissension weakened the union's leadership. A measure of the UFW's decline is the fact that many farmers no longer consider the union a potent adversary. The number of UFW contracts has dwindled dramatically. Today, the union says it has 60 bargaining agreements. At its height in the late 70s, the UFW claimed hundreds of contracts. They had about 100,000 workers under contract. Today, I think there are probably fewer than 10,000 workers under contract, maybe as few as 4,000. Villarejo says union leadership is partly to blame for the decline. I think they've basically retreated significantly from the fields in the face of the anti-labor sentiment predominant in Sacramento and in Washington or for most of the 80s, in the face of the influx of new immigrant workers, and in the face of a decision that they made to go to the boycott as a response to that political development. The UFW's renewed consumer boycott of grapes is a central thrust of an overall strategy, one that has de-emphasized bargaining agreements. A UFW-produced film warns of the dangers of pesticides for consumers as well as farm workers. But grape growers insist the union's boycott is having little impact on sales and is unnecessary. Most of these great pickers at Kovakovich and Sons near Bakersfield, California, make $5.40 an hour plus 28 cents a box. They average $60 a day. Co-owners Michael and John Kovakovich say they provide decent wages and health benefits, even though their employees are non-union. Well, we're a family farm, and uh, we take pride in the ongoing uh, relationship with the workers. They get paid every Friday. If there's a problem with their check, it's taken care of right away. And like I talked about earlier, we're paying a comparable wage to everyone else in the area. The chemicals you ask, what chemicals we use, there's a lot of them. But they're used to keep 
the fruit clean and the American public out there can rest assured that uh, the only poison coming out of these vineyards is the rumor, not the poison itself. The growers are not the only critics of the boycott. Many farm labor advocates contend the UFW would be more effective if it focused less on the boycott and more on the fields. The boycott itself is, is, is a large expenditure for the UFW. Um, their nationwide boycott, spending a lot of money that could be spent, I think, in organizing. Pete Matarino is president of a rival union, the 1,200-member Independent Union of Agricultural Workers. In July, members of Matarino's union, mushroom pickers in Watsonville, California, met after their employer imposed a pay cut. They voted to strike. The ranks of smaller unions like this are growing. Increasingly, farm workers are signing up to be represented by unions other than the UFW. In response, the UFW is attempting to recoup its losses. In addition to the great boycott, it has launched a membership drive, and it is pressuring farmers to improve wages and working conditions even without bargaining agreements. Workers are living under vines, they're living under trees because there's not enough money to pay for rent, there's not enough housing available for them. That's why they're out here protesting today. Last year, UFW leaders organized hundreds of Southern California grape workers to walk off their jobs. These workers hadn't had raises in over seven years. Although the UFW didn't win any new contracts as a result of the walkouts, it was able to pressure growers into providing workers a wage increase from 5.25 to 5.40 an hour. The impact of the protests was felt in vineyards throughout the state. Non-union grape workers at Kovakovich and Sons also got a raise. It wasn't so much that we were running scared, it's just that we followed the industry. Now the UFW might say we forced wages up, and they might be correct, but um, I don't really feel as though that uh, they might not have gone up anyway because we were due for an increase. The UFW is also trying to build strength by recruiting farm workers without contracts. At offices like this one in Salinas, new members can obtain health insurance, legal advice, and financial services. By signing up new members, UFW President Rodriguez hopes to expand the union's power base. At that point, when you have uh, a certain percentage, for example, organized at a certain ranch that are now members, and they want to take that risk. They want to go after and, and challenge their employer and so forth. And they feel that they're strong enough to do it. They have a base to do it. Rodriguez admits the UFW is facing an uphill battle. While he holds out the promise of improved conditions, many farm workers are hoping things don't continue to deteriorate.